Hello, hello, and welcome to Marsh Stream and tonight's solo arts heal. Oops, I gotta get rid of this poll. With Ann Can, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Stephanie Wiseman, artistic director and founder of the Marsh and Marsh Stream. Please consider supporting Marsh Stream and its artists with a tax deductible donation to the tip jar. And please subscribe to the Marsh's YouTube channel and be notified when our sh shows go live. You can see all our scheduled and archived shows at themarsh.org. Let me tell you a little bit about what's coming up on Marsh Stream. There's the Monday Night Marsh, there's Wild Card Tuesdays, and on Wednesday nights, you know, there's Solo Arts Heal. Thursdays, it's Stephanie's Marsh Stream. That's my interview show featuring this week, Josh Kornbluth, who will be discussing Marsh Stream's amazing and iconic community bingo improv game. Josh is reading some surprising 1948 letters from his father, who was in Georgia getting out the vote to get a socialist presidential candidate elected. Friday at noon, it's CJ Fitness Sing with Candace Johnson. This is a singing and a fitness class. And bingo is at 7.30 p.m. Saturday solo performer Spotlight features a documentary already free about Qigong and its impact on two people. There will be a post-film Q&A with the director. And starting next Wednesday, before South Solo Arts Heal at 5 p.m., we will be offering a Qigong class for the next five weeks. It's a Healing Wednesday. Let me tell you also now about Solo Arts Heal. It's a program where performers present real-life empowering stories, a theater of resilience that celebrates overcoming mental and physical life challenges and offers hope and inspiration. Marsh Stream Solo Arts Heal program includes excerpts, talkbacks, and a Q&A providing education and advocacy that support, support communities through educational outreach and the healing power of the arts. We are so thrilled tonight that both Gail Shickley and I welcome Ann Can and a new once a month host, Rick Davis, to Solo Arts Heal. I met Ann Can founder Rick Davis at a memorial for a mutual friend, Eric Bookbinder, where I first found out about Ann Can and the wonderful things Rick and his cohorts are doing. Now let's welcome Mr. Rick Davis. Hello, good evening, everybody. I am honored to be here on behalf of Anne Can. And um, as Stephanie said, we met um, at Eric Arrest His Soul's uh, memorial. Um, and uh, Eric's wife, I believe, uh, at the time was on your board. Uh, and this is how it's developed and, and greetings to all the bookbinders who are, uh, who are watching. Um, Anne Can is a small nonprofit, mostly volunteer. We provide uh, support, uh, advocacy and navigation to patients and for all kinds of diseases and conditions. Uh, and we come across a whole variety of people, some of whom turn out to be performers. We don't always know they're performers, but uh, when they join our virtual support groups, it's pretty easy to pick out the ones who perform and the ones who don't perform. And our eye fell on a certain member of one of our groups um, who clearly was a performer. And so when Stephanie came to me and said, would we be interested in hosting a show once a month with people that we sourced from Ancan? I knew right away who our first performer was going to be. And I would very much like to introduce you to, to Jackson Nogal. Hello, Jackson. Hello, Rick. How are you doing tonight? Good evening. I am doing well. And um, I hope you're doing well. And I am doing well. I'm thrilled to be here. I thank, uh, thank you and Stephanie and uh, the, um, the Marsh crew for having me. I really appreciate it because I'm, I'm not much of a per performer. I'm just starting to do that. So I don't know. We'll let, we'll let the audience decide. Okay. What I want to ask you um, before we start 
is what would you like to share about your condition, your medical history? What does, does the, is there anything the audience needs to know to appreciate the rain delay? Um, not, not a ton probably. Um, it's basically about my first day uh, back at work after I had surgery for prostate cancer and um, some hilarity ensued. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, you know, making light of a very serious condition takes a lot of talent, a lot of intelligence, and a lot of humor. And I think we should, we should allow the audience to see how you are going to kick us off with the rain delay. What do you think? That'd be wonderful. Okay. Please roll, please roll tape, as they say in the booth. Please roll tape, and you may Kristen. need to turn up your volume on the vi on your um, on your own computers, your YouTube. Um, here you go. Exactly eight weeks after April 6, two thousand eleven, it was time to return to work. My Family Medical Leave Act get out of job free card had expired. I'd been recuperating from a surgery that my doctor described in the words of a 1990s skateboarder, a radical prostatectomy. <laughs> like way rad bra, ever since Dr. P had scoped cancer in my prostate bowl, dude had been stoked to go carving and grinding and to make an inside front grab of my gnarly baby daddy pump. For my first day back at work, I'd been invited to a work outing to see the Chicago Cubs play. It was a reward for all the crazy hours we'd all been putting in. Don't mind if I do, I'd replied. Only my boss knew where I had been for the past eight weeks and of the call I had received when I was alone on the evening of Valentine's Day. It had reminded me of the Ben Franklin quote, the only thing certain in life is death and I couldn't remember the rest. When we got to Wrigley, the first thing I heard was, cold beer here. Now I hadn't had even one drink since my prostate surgery. Plus, I had lost a little weight. The average prostate gland weighs about 11 grams. I was two one hundredths of a pound more likely to get wasted in front of my colleagues. But the beer man didn't cater to lightweights like me. He only sold tall boys, extra large cans of Budweiser. I threw caution to the wind. Don't mind if I do. After all, what could possibly go wrong getting liquored up at a work event? We watched the game with the umpires calling players safe and out. But pretty soon nature, Mother Nature was calling this player out. I had a pee like a Clydesdale. I trotted to the communal trough that Wrigley Field calls a men's room. Just when I ponied up to it, I let out a tropical storm. Dude, most rewarding work outing ever. When you hire a urologist to extract your prostate, it's a bit like hiring a plumber to remodel both the bedroom and the bathroom. Only in this case, poor workmanship could lead to an untimely death. The work in the bedroom is fairly straightforward. Think of the prostate gland like a cocktail shaker. You take one part sperm, add some mixers, shake your money maker, and voila, sex on the beach. But after a radical shakerectomy, the bar is closed. <laughs> but don't worry, Bettys. We shakerectomy survivors can still party long and hard. Now, contractors tend to undersell the work needed in a bathroom. In my case, my prostate plumber had to not only remove my prostate gland, but also two stop valves that lay between my bladder and my downspout. And that added months to the project for potty retraining. Oh, not like a toddler. Think of it more like the weight room. Baby, I just pressed 100 kegels. 
Oh, and in addition to wearing jock straps, we also have to wear what marketers call male garbs. Basically, male maxi pads. I call them bachelor pads because if I'm getting hot and heavy with a sweetie and she finds a guard down there, I'm gonna remain a bachelor. Meanwhile, back at Wrigley, cold beer here was talking round two. Don't mind if I do. But pretty soon my bladder was getting pissed off at me. Don't mind if I do too, he mocked. Cold beer there equals racehorse analogy here, get it? I did and I galloped back to the trough and on my way I felt a little pea squirt onto my guard. I'm taking heavy fire, he shouted. A few rounds shot past his post creating collateral damage on my Levi's. What to do? While I was in the bathroom, I realized the quick thinking and a magic trick could save me from eternal shame. While I washed my hands, abracadabra, I flicked water all over my jeans. They need a new plumber in there, look at me, I could explain. When I got back to my seat, I had won the battle. But within minutes, the war raged on. No less than the King of Beers was reigning over my Clydesdale pea raid. What to do? Now, I hadn't been particularly religious since Catholic school, but it was time to find my way back to the Lord, and fast. Sweet Jesus, I prayed. Please give me strength, at least to my smaller, but still large, companion. Now, I prayed to Jesus, and not God or the Holy Spirit, because I remember that he had real human experience with these matters. After all, his quick thinking and magic trick kept him dry by walking on top of the water. Within minutes, my prayers were answered. Raindrops started falling from the sky. God damn it, cried a red-blooded Cubs fan. Jesus, undamn it cried this yellow peeing self-respect fan. My prayers were answered again. It started deluging rain. My jeans got soaked. I no longer had to hold every drop in. I did have to maintain some control. In my experience, even a proverbial flood can only dilute so much pee. And I didn't want to give the ladies a taste of what the men's room smells like after five innings of Cold beer here. We ran to El Hardin for shelter. The waiter touted their famous extra large margaritas. No me importa si no lo hago, I thought as I ran for the changing of the guards. By the end of lunch, even my only replacement guard had become shell shocked. It was time to deploy or I would be the only rotten smelling sardine on a rush hour train packed to the gills. As I was leaving, I spotted Mindy, the most beautiful woman in the office. I had a secret crush on her. Jackson, she spotted me too. Her perfect smile beckoned me. Where did you travel on your sabbatical? I realized that I shouldn't share my story with her and by extension, the fact that we would both die someday. That would deep six any chance I would ever have on asking her out. To Helen back, I kept walking, if only she knew. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, about this uh, Jackson. Um, before you started this idea of performing, um, had you had any other thoughts about um, using art to help you deal with your disease? Yeah, I mean, I had a couple. The first was, um, if people are old enough to remember the early rap, uh, run. Uh, DMC and they had a song called You Be Illin. And I thought that would be perfect, but then I decided that it had been done already. So I decided to move on and uh, 
I, but I, what I really wanted to do, joking aside, was um, I started to write a memoir. I wanted to write a memoir of all the um, crazy and funny experiences I had uh, during my diagnosis and treatment for prostate cancer, which has been uh, 10 years now. It was 10 years on Valentine's Day. And so I started to do this and then I came up with the name War and P for my memoir because uh, getting a cancer diagnosis is war. And um, as you just saw in that story, having your prostate removed by surgery, there's some incontinence issues. So um, I started doing that. But then last year, just on a fluke, I decided to write um, a story for the stage, which is that one we just saw. I was able to do a reading of it um, live in a theater here in Chicago, Comedy Sports. Um, and then I was scheduled to do it live uh, for a um, Chicago storytelling organization, which I should remember, but it's, uh, I get brain fog from these drugs I'm on. Um, but uh, yeah, it, COVID came, but then I was able to do it on their first uh, Zoom night. So I got the very fun experience of trying to do comedy with zero feedback, um, like I'm doing tonight. So hopefully, uh, I'll get my COVID shots and try to get on stage and uh, actually experience a real audience. So how, how's the um, War and P memoir coming along? Well, you know, I, I, I put it down since I started writing these stories for the stage. So I'll probably pick it up again, uh, potentially tomorrow. But I do like, I do like doing these because it's just a little more interactive. Uh, but I mean, they're both, they're both equally, I mean, they're very different because obviously you have to completely paint a picture um, in the memoir, but then uh, it's a lonely job as a writer, especially during COVID. So uh, I, I am part of a couple of writing groups that I meet with in the, uh, in the morning uh, that's helped, helped me with that. But then they also talk about in these writing groups how um, before you publish a book, and I'm sure I won't, I'll have to self-publish it, but before you do it, publish a book, it's good to have a platform. Uh, so this is my platform. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was thinking it was sort of a bit of a slippery slope into performing from writing, you start sliding into perform. I don't know where you go after the, after the videos. Maybe you do the videos and then it's the stand up and what have you. But your problem is you've got to clamber back up that slippery slope to do the writing again, right? Yeah. I'll, although I am, I'm 75,000 words into the writing. So oh, wow. Yeah. I've got a lot of, a lot of it written, um, but there's still, that's only halfway. And then there's all the editing and okay. everything. So. Yeah, well, if, if, if we've got any, uh, any book publishers listening, book agents listening, there could be some uh, some really good work co coming along here. Yeah, I um, mean that's that's one of the funny funny but morbid things because uh, publishers want to sign someone who's going to give them a stream of books, and who knows how long I'll be alive, so how many books I'll have in me. So I think you'll be with us. You're going to be with us a long time, Jackson. So. Uh, you have another piece that you're going to show us. Um, any introduction that you would like to uh, provide to the next piece? No, I think it'll just stand on its own. Thanks. Okay, so why, why don't we roll the next piece, piece and then we will talk a little bit um, after that uh, about how you've used performing arts to, to help you manage your condition. Great. Let's go. I recently did some modeling work. You may not be able to tell, because I'm wearing clothes, but I have a killer body. It's been proven by science. It all started like this. In the fall, I took a test. Killer body? It wondered. 
Now, I'd had a killer body before, having been diagnosed and treated for prostate cancer. Oh, if you don't know, the prostate gland is what produces the liquid that gives babies their baby daddy genes. I have had mine removed years ago. Now this test, my numbers have gone up by 0.1 billionth of a gram. Nothing to text home about. Then again, in my experience with life-threatening diseases, when they're stable, you forget all about them. But when there's a change of even a minute amount, your imagination can lead to some pretty deep, dark places. My imagination first started to think of horror stories, but then, well, he decided, you tell him, to become a model. There's big bucks and fame in modeling for people with killer bodies. I couldn't argue with that. We went to see an agent. Jenny T. U., one of the best. Let's get some professional photos of you, she said. Where do I sign up? I'm scheduling two photo shoots of you for the same day. Oh, and don't eat anything that morning. Now, I've seen how skinny models are, but was one meal really going to make a difference? We went for the photos. The first thing I noticed, these artists have some wacky names for their studios. Nuclear imaging. <laughs> My, don't we take ourselves a little seriously. Then again, it was on brand for my body type. The assistant took me back, sat me in a chair, and proceeded to give me an intravenous drug. Oh, I'd heard how rampant recreational drug use was among models, but I didn't expect it to be so, well, expected. My imagination hoped, we're finally gonna experience what ecstasy is like. It would take a little while for the drugs to kick in, so we moved on to our second location. Would this one be called Rocket Science Studios? <laughs> Au contraire. The sign said, Imaging Center. Ooh la la, train minimalist. And get this, they'd be taking a CAT scan. I wrote a poem. <clears throat> My agent must think of me as a cool cat. A cat with a killer enough body to warrant a cat scan. The assistant said, you'll need to disrobe. Now, I know a lot of models take nude shots and, well, Frankly, I was flattered. But then I remembered, you can't teach an old dog nude pics. Fortunately, the assistant gave me two robes. Put one on normal, one on backward. Whew. Saved by the booty shot blockers. Then he gave me a free mochaccino in a bottle. I took a taste. It tasted funny. Had some faceless factory barista slipped a Mickey in my drink? I looked at the label. Coffee, milk, sugar, barium. Now, I know there's a lot of beautiful people with funky diets. Was barium the new keto? It had a spoonful of sugar, so it had a spoonful of sugar, so I choked my mochaccino down. My mochaccino down. My mochaccino down.
when I went into the studio, I warmed up my poses. But the photographer said, lie down on the table. Then he left the room, closed the door, and proceeded to talk to me over an intercom. Like, I don't got no COVID, dude. As I lay there, I examined the camera. At my feet was this huge donut looking thing. The table would move my torso in and out of the donut hole. Now wait a minute. They take a guy who can no longer produce baby daddy genes, force him to have intimate relations on camera with a clownishly large cattle? And get this, the name on the camera was Siemens. I'd heard of practical jokes before, but I couldn't imagine one being so cruel. When we were finished, there was no cuddling, no pillow talk. The photographer pointed the way out the back door. We felt used. Back to nuclear imaging. This photographer would be taking photos of my entire skeleton. Oh, I heard how important bone structure was for models. They weren't kidding. And what a cool gig the photographer had. It's literally like Halloween, a scary skeleton Halloween every day. And this camera was much more cozy than the last one. It literally passed within millimeters of my nose. In fact, if it could have given consent, I might have given it a bunny kiss. It's been a long, lonely, hugless COVID. When we were finished, we sashayed our bones out the front door. The following Monday, we returned with my friend Abby to see Jenny T.U. The photos turned out to be excellent, but somehow they weren't good. In the flash of a paparazzo, my life changed. Sitting in front of me was my Jenny T. Urinary medical oncologist. She was no longer my agent. This had no longer been a photo shoot. I was no longer an aspiring model. But I did have a killer body. Again. As I mentioned earlier, years before, I had had my prostate gland removed from my prostate bed. A few years later, the cure was to zap my prostate bed with 40 rounds of radiation. But now, just like Big Baby Bear found Goldilocks sleeping in his bed, that cat had found a small two centimeter soft tissue mass lying in mine. He was still there. Now, when you have a killer lurking inside your body, a small, a small 
two centimeter tissue mass seems pretty big. It's a little like those old movies where someone has a small revolver, but they're calling from inside the house. Only in my case, my assassination had my assassin had been hiding downstairs in my private basement. The photographer said there was no way to kill my assassin, only to stunt his growth with drugs. Oh, and as seen on TV, there may be side effects. ADT may cause memory loss, mood, mood swings, depression, fatigue, loss of muscle mass, bone thinning, weight gain, hot flashes, libido loss, gynecomastia. What the hell is that? I didn't know either. Talk to your doctor. I did. She said, these drugs function in a similar way to castration. Now, later, I asked the woman I live with what she thought. Alexa, what do you think? Many legal experts consider these drugs to be violations of the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment for sex offenders. For sex offenders? I wasn't even having legal loving sex, but it was either do or die. So I made my vow. Till death do us part. Like a shotgun wedding with no fun in the hayloft. As we were leaving, my friend Abby called me. Jackson, look on the bright side. At least your murder in Goldilocks was found in only one bed. <sighs> Abby was so right. Locks could have been found like stage four murdering Goldilockses all over my body. I have years to live, and if I can no longer produce muscle mass, well, I know there are people that just model their hands, but then my imagination had a better idea. Well, I heard that there's this guy in Maine. I think his name is Stefan King. Anyway, he got rich and famous by just telling horror stories. I can't argue with that. And here I am. Now, does anyone here know an agent? Well, thank you again, Mr. Nogal. That's um, my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I, Apologies I, for the low vacuum, uh, low volume. I recorded that <laughs> late at night, and I live in a condo with very thin walls, so I was trying not to uh, have the neighbors hear my story ten times in a row because I couldn't remember the words. <laughs> um. Before we go on, and I have a few questions um, that I'd like to ask you, if the audience has anything they would like to put to, to Jackson Nogal, please use the Q&A and um, we'll keep an eye on it and we will pose those questions uh, to him. But let, let's get back to some of the thoughts that I have. How, um, how has performing arts, whether it be writing, whether it be video, how has that helped you manage 
the condition that you live with on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, it definitely, it definitely gives me a different perspective. And, you know, throughout my life, I've done a lot of writing and tried to write comedy. And um, if you, you know, if you watch any good comic, I shouldn't say any good comic, but a lot of the best comics, uh, especially after the African-American comics, um, the comedy comes from pain. And if you, if you stop laughing and listen to what they're really talking about, it's some very difficult situations. And I think that's true for me in a different way uh, as well. If I can take those, you know, going, going alone to have a CAT scan and then um, uh, uh, scintigraphy is the bone scan you know, it's, it's kind of a weird process. And then, you know, I was lying on the CAT scan and there was confusion in my doctor's order. So I had to lie there a little longer. Um, and then I saw that Siemens label. And of course it was comedy genius for a prostate cancer. So, um, you know, but uh, yeah, I think it's really helped me. I've also, you know, have various struggles with depression as well. And, uh, you know, anytime you can, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of things you can do. I mean, there's looking around and understanding, you know, how many people, uh, you know, have similar issues or even at, even at ANCAN. So ANCAN, I think I've um, been attending your meetings since last summer. And I just, found out about ANCAN uh, in a fluke because I had seen my uh, uh, medical oncologist speaking at an event and I try to watch when she speaks. Uh, so then I can ask her even more, you know, I always have my list of questions. So it's about this long, which includes me reading, you know, cancer journals and that sort of thing. And I'm sure a lot of times she's like, you know, what? <laughs> why are you reading these journals? But anyway, that's one of the ways I cope. But um, yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of different ways to cope by, you know, I, I was just talking about ANCAN, you know, and I have joined the ANCAN group uh, for people with advanced recurrent uh, malignant cancer. Fortunately, I'm not malignant yet, although that, um, you know, as I watch what others have gone through, that will come. But, you know, it's just been a huge help for me to see other people who are really surviving this disease. And, you know, there's people, uh, you know, that have been on these drugs that I'm on for, you know, 20 years and, you know, they're still living and that really made a difference there. So I think there's a lot of different things that have really helped me, um, be more positive about this and, and think more about what life I have left to live rather than worrying about a lot of things that I may or may not get to experience. So let me just pick up on something. You said you, you had done writing um, before you were diagnosed. What did you write about then? And, and did you perform any of that? And, or was it published? Can um, we see Jackson Nogal 20 years ago? No, I mean, there is, I do have one, I did do a year long city through the players workshop of the second city that was before second city had a big uh, school. I'm not sure if everyone knows second city, it's the uh, improv theater in Chicago and also in Toronto, where a lot of people uh, joined Saturday Night Live from. And I did a year long, I, you know, I actually did the class originally because I used to be really, really shy. And I even have a reference letter that says, uh, um, although John is uh, inordinately shy, he holds his, himself one on one. So fortunately there's two of us, just two of us here, but uh, yeah. So I do have a tape from that show uh, from, I think it was 1990. It was a really long time oh my ago. Gosh. Did you have hair then? What's that? Did you have hair at that time? I had hair, yeah, I had hair. Oh, <laughs> was it curly? Was it straight? It was a little, yeah, it was curly. I was never able to grow long hair because my hair always sort of went out a little and not, oh, I see. not done. But yeah, but I did have hair. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then I've done a, a, 
a couple, or I guess, yeah, a couple classes in stand-up comedy, mainly because I was afraid to do open mics because the classes really don't help either. And I did do a few open mics, which was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it'd be hard to tell stories like this because at least the open mics in Chicago, you get like four minutes. And it, I could, you know, grab a four minute segment of these stories, but, uh, you know, so, it's, it's a little different, um, different medium right. for lack of a better word. So um, it, it raises a question from the audience, from MJ, who says, can we look forward to future stand-up stories? Oh yeah, and that's my, that's my very dear friend in uh, Michigan. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, I've got a number of these uh, still in my head. I mean, there's one, you know, I haven't covered uh, my 40 rounds of radiation yet, which is, uh, I, you know, I chose um, a therapy called proton therapy because um, it was, seen to potentially cause less damage to my bladder and uh, my colon. And I was, you know, I'm, I'm 58 now. That was probably five or six years ago. So if I do live a long time, I want to have, I, you know, I want to have my uh, bladder and colon intact. But I actually had to go way out deep into the suburbs for that. And you know, it was an hour and a half round trip. It was like 45 minutes there. So it was very long because I, I don't have a car and I was using public transportation. Um, but weird little things come out of these things. Like uh, I met one of my um, best friends in the, uh, in the train station on the way home. There's this uh, woman there, uh, shout out to Kat, who had this big um, shallow case and, uh, we became deep friends. So there's good things that come out of this uh, too, but you know, there's a lot of different things from that, from getting, you know, I have, I have bling inside me. I've got two gold uh, markers that they call uh, fiducial markers. Originally I was calling them fiduciary markers, but that was a lack of understanding and because they were gold. So, um, and then there was, you know, the, the, I, you know, I do have a photo from it. Uh, the last day I was there, I had them take a picture of me lying on the table with a big red apple in my mouth because I wanted to look like I was a pig on a uh, spit in a barbecue. So hopefully uh, <laughs> that will work out as the cover photo for War and Pea and yeah. <laughs> and then um, I and then I have a whole thing on health insurance too, which I won't even go into uh, here. But you know, buying individual health insurance and not being able to, uh, not having any of the teaching hospitals in my network for a few years. Fortunately, when I got this last diagnosis, which was that last piece there, I was able to go to Northwestern again and shout out to Northwestern, which right. is one of the great cancer centers, not only in Chicago, but in the country, so. Well, I think um, you, you're kind of lucky in, in, in Chicago, for, for those of you you are not aware, or you may have figured by now, um, Jackson lives in, in, um, in, in Chicago, in the city, uh, but uh, many of the people watching are from the Bay Area, and, and they have to deal with Kaiser Permanente, and and that is a a, a great um, future source for Stephen King to write a few stories. Um, <laughs> I I speak from experience um, myself because I was a Kaiser patient for, for 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 many years. That is a totally different experience again. But I want to come back. I want to come back to how you manage your your disease and your condition and, and, and living now um, with a condition that can, cannot be cured. It can only be managed for the rest of your life. Um, beyond performance, what else do you do to live with that every day? I mean, you wake up in the morning. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, in the morning, I've, I've got structure now that I have these writing groups. Uh, 
So I do one from 9 to 9.45, and then I do another one from uh, 11 to 12.45. And, and it's kind of funny. I mean, if you're, if you're not a writer, this will sound really crazy. But what we do is we... Uh, so for the first one, it's someone with a free Zoom account. And I'm sure everyone knows after a year of Zoom, if you have a free account in more than two people, it dies after 40 minutes. So we all go on the Zoom. We all mute ourselves. We all write for a half hour and then we chat. And then the second one's similar, but that one we go from 11 to 12.30 and we write and then we chat. And uh, it just adds a lot of structure to my day. It's a nice to have people around. I also um, I'm trying to, you know, I've, I already had um, osteoporosis and these drugs I'm on, as you all know, but a lot of people in the audience don't. Um, and I, as I said in my auctioneer voice, uh, they cause um, bone thinning and uh, muscle atrophy. So I'm trying to do weight bearing exercises. I also, for COVID, I got a, a rowing machine. Uh, I learned how to row uh, a friend of mine, a shout out to her organization, um, uh, Row, uh, which is recovery on water. They actually let the public use their ergs or rowing machines. And in, in the rowing biz, as you know, because you're a rower, they're called ergs. And uh, I learned to do that in a group. And then I ended up uh, Pony and up money so I'd be able to exercise throughout the winter. And then I'm trying, it's it's been hard for me. I'm I'm, you know, it's funny with the food thing because I'm afraid of food now. Uh, and you know, I've talked to a nutritionist, and you know, people tell me don't be afraid, but you know, I try to meet um primarily a, a vegan diet. Uh I try to you know, I used to love to go out and have cocktails with my friends, but I try to really limit my alcohol now because that's one thing that they do say is a carcinogen. Um, you know, so, uh, and then, you know, I visit my doctor a lot and, you know, and it's still, you know, learn and, and I educate myself a ton. So I learn a lot from ANCAN, but I also, like I said, I uh, look at all kinds of articles and there's a lot of, webinars and that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I know what the progression of my drugs is going to be because cancer mutates is, you know, better than anyone, anyone, just, just so the people in the audience know a little more about ANCAN. Rick is, uh, knows everything we have. We'll have someone come on to one of our calls from, you know, Cincinnati and Rick will know the genetic urinary, um, medical oncologist in that area or someone will call from, you know, well, Rick lives in Arizona, but someone will call from New Mexico or wherever. He always seems to know the woman or the guy there, but. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's just that I've been doing this a, lo a long, long time. Um, how do you, do you find it easy to, to stay in the moment, to stop your, to stop your monkey mind? I mean, I think you, um, you're taking, you've taken some courses and you're, you're doing some, some more courses to, to try and help you center your mind at this point in time, right? Yeah, well, I've been doing uh, meditation for a while. Shout out to this organization, Shambhala, uh, which is national, but there's a part in Chicago and I've taken a lot of classes in meditation over the years. I meditate every day. Uh, and then I've mentioned this to the ANCAN group, but one other thing Northwestern had, which I thought was very helpful is I've been doing, a, um, for six or seven weeks now, I've been doing a course called um, Meaning, uh, M uh, Meaning Centered Psychotherapy, I think is the name. And it's by, it started, uh, it started with this, uh, guy Victor Frankel, who um, was a uh, psychologist or psychiatrist, I think, in in Austria. And in fact, it's really a funny story because I mentioned his name to friends of mine, and one of my friends studied under him in uh, Vienna years ago. But uh, Victor Frankel, uh, you know, was a, a leading uh, psychiatrist who. Uh, ended up um, being put in a, a 
concentration camp in World War II, a, a Jewish guy. And he wrote a book um, about how, how people who are in you know, dire straits like that can still find meaning in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so, uh, such a great positive idea. And, you know, when I look at my disease now, I mean, I'm not in a concentration camp, you know, I'm not, I don't have one of the very fast moving cancers. And uh, so it's um, just all these different perspectives you know, that I can find and look into really can help me because, you know, as, as I said in the video, and as you well know, in your work, uh, you know, your mind can go to a deep, dark place. And uh, um, yeah, so anyway. So um, Josh um, Bookminder has a question. He wants to know to what extent um, are these pieces that you perform therapeutic versus just being available material that you can use to do a, uh, a performance? No, I think they're, they're very, therape very therapeutic for me. Um, you know, just, just looking at the humorous side of, you know, these sterile environments and, and also the, you know, the, the, uh, the first video where we played the, um, the rain delay, you know, both of these stories are completely true. I mean, I exaggerate and I, you know, do the poetry and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, I did go to see the Cubs play the very first day I came back from surgery and no one told me that drinking a little beer was not, you know, was, you know, and, and I did have my little, you know, my little pads on and, uh, it did start pouring rain because otherwise I would have had to get the hell out of there and uh, and then figured out how to get home with you know a wet leg on the L you know and there's certainly plenty of people on the L that don't smell that good but uh, <laughs> could have been me so yeah they have been therapeutic and in doing the second one you know when I was you know I decided not to just make it funny but to make it. Uh, you know, really get down to that moment when I got this news. And, you know, a few times when I was rehearsing that, I was just a, a blubbering mess um, yeah. uh, trying to do that, which is one of the reasons besides worrying about bandwidth tonight that I wanted to record it rather than doing it live, so. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I can see how um, performing this is, is tremendously cathartic. I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're really able to get those emotions out of you and, and, and to make them almost tangible and, and maybe even to pick up the bad ones and throw them away somewhere. Uh, you know, this, do you agree? Exactly. And I come from uh, both of my grandmothers were 100 percent German. Both of my grandfathers were 100 percent Irish. So uh we're not we're not that good at you know at uh, talking about our feelings. So <laughs> that's kind of yeah. a, a yeah. difficult thing in the family and uh, and very much for me. So yeah, I was just thinking about the Cubs and you going to see the Cubs and uh, they may never let me back into Chicago once I say this, but may maybe seven or eight years ago, just going to see the Cubs could have been enough to get you uh, to, to to give you a cancer. <laughs> um, things have things have changed now, of course. So we, we we now have to reckon with with a real team at Wrigley Field. I was actually really lucky to to get to Wrigley Field um, for the first time ever. I lived in Chicago um, for a couple of years when I was in grad school. I'd never been to see the Cubs, and then um, one of the gents with whom uh, who I we had provided support to. Um, knew that I was going to be in Chicago for a conference and, and came up with Cubs tickets. And it was a, it was a tremendous experience. It was really a wonderful experience to, to, to get to Wrigley Field. Have you always been a Cubs supporter? No, I'm, I'm not a sports fan at all, to tell you the oh, truth. Oh, really? So, okay. yeah. Um, and I was fortunate to find that photo with uh, a no Creative Commons, no fee photo for the beginning of that uh, that taping, which which a friend of mine uh, who is a uh, film director uh, 
did, which was really nice of him. You know, he had the three cameras going on and everything. So, uh, yeah, I've never been that big of a sports fan, but you know that I don't say that too much in Chicago. And actually, my my condo low overlooks Soldier Field, and I'm definitely not much of a football fan, but uh, wow. I keep that on the down low in Chicago. Just that's okay. Great. So let, let me ask you: um, There's only so much cancer treatment and health insurance that you can talk about, and health-related matters that you can talk about. Um, where do you think um, you might go next when you're done with the when you're done with with the cancer experience? What else intrigues you to write about? Yeah, I I, uh, I mean, there's a number of things. I mean, one thing that's also an illness is I have some had some issues with mental illness in my life, and that's even affected me more than prostate cancer. But then there's there's just a, a I keep I've been keeping a log of things I find funny, uh, you know, since, uh, you know, for years. So, I mean, when I did the stand up bit, I remember doing a bit about, um, you know, the, this was before Uber was a big thing about, you know, feeling so good when I was taking a cab because everyone's waving at you. Cause if you're in a cab, everyone's <laughs> in a cab so, you know, you feel, pretty honored you know if you know you feel like you're in a, a black car if some people are uh, waving at you while you're riding so so um we're we're sort of coming close to the end of the of the uh, our time now and um i really would i really want to thank you for, from from my own debts that you are willing to share this um we at ANCAN support a number of diseases, but our mother load has always been prostate cancer. That's how we started. That's where we started. That's where I started. And, and we built on that. And um, the subjects around prostate cancer are not easy to talk about. And it takes a lot of courage. And I, I just want to, um, to give you kudos for, for bringing these subjects out into the open and being willing to talk openly about them. Um, that is not easy. And, and I think the audience, I'm sure the audience will appreciate and has appreciated that and, and a big thank you to you. Um, I would like to say that um, if anybody who is watching is interested in any of the ANCAN groups, um, we have a whole number for various, for different conditions, not just cancer, conditions like MS, for example, um, for other cancers. And our groups are all free and drop in. And sometimes you find some really interesting people like Jackson Nagal in the group. Who knows, you may meet your next uh, best friend there. Um, I want to remind you that there is a tip jar here. All us 501c3s rely on tips and uh, the marsh is no exception uh, so please don't leave without uh, visiting the tip jar and we will be back again uh, I think the end of April the fourth Wednesday in April we will have um, possibly a very interesting and unusual act for you uh, uh, having nothing to do with prostate cancer the next one uh, so Please come and join us. And with that, uh, thank you. Good night.